Jones. And I've watched him maintain his integrity. I've watched him keep his equilibrium. And I've watched him cling close to Calvary's cross. And uh, I admire this man. want to be just like him someday. Following after you, Brother Griffin. Come, take this. Let's make him feel welcome right now. Let's worship the Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for your goodness and your kindness. Thank you for the power of your spirit. Thank you for the reality of your hands. We love you. Praise and worship you, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are so great in our heart and life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. While you're standing, we'll read to you from Proverbs chapter 3 and begin at verse 5. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. We are grateful, God, for your presence today and for your design to touch human life and to hold the hearts of men in your hands and to give strength and courage to those in need to encourage and to lift up and to develop and to mold human life into a house you're going to inhabit someday forever and forever. What a marvelous thing, God, to be in your hands and to trust you with all of our lives. We ask your touch today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. And you may be seated. He said to trust him. He wants you to have that assured reliance on his character. He wants you to believe that his attributes will control every area and aspect of life. He wants you to know that you can surrender to him. And that he will be faithful to you. That he will strengthen you. And be the truth in your life. You can believe him. You can hope in him. You can have confidence in him. And depend on him. Because he is a God. Who did this thing right. He makes no mistakes. He knew why he called you. He knew what he had in mind. When he put his hand upon you. When his fingerprint was put upon your soul. He in intended someday. To have that as a part of his eternal dwelling place. You know, he don't make no junk. Hallelujah. And the temple he's building, he wants to live in forever. It's going to be a little different from the old one. That when he had back there, you remember in Exodus 31, he said, I gave to them skill. I gave to them wisdom, understanding. I put my spirit in them so they would know how to carve. So they would know how to mold. So they would know how to hammer. How they would put the gold in place and the silver in its place. And, I, and all that so that they have the skill to make the most sacred object ever made by human hands. And that object was an Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. And yet this one I'm working on today is far superior. This one we're working on is eternal. This is the eternal dwelling place of God. And so that's why he wants me to trust him, lean on him, because he does know what he's talking about. He knows what he's doing. We have a tendency to try to work out things our own way. We have a tendency to put life in our own hands and say, I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. I'm heading in that direction. I am going to force things to happen. I'm going to be an achiever. I'm going to be a success in life. But God's asking for somebody today to learn his ways and lean not to your own understanding. Lean to his understanding. Lean upon his way of thinking. Lean upon his ideas and his philosophy. So that you can grasp the realities of life. 
and have an understand, understanding. He said, acknowledge him in all your ways. That is, you recognize his authority in your life. You recognize he has rights. You take notice of him. You pay attention to him. You accept anything he says is valid. You agree with him. You give deference to him. His slightest desire is your command. Because he is your savior. He is a great redeemer. And he does all things right. Praise God. And uh, it's amazing how we tend to do things our way sometimes. And, and we just feel like we've got to be right. We just know we're right. I am reminded of uh, a book I read this summer. Probably one of the greatest books I've read in a while. Alan Nelson's Broken in the Right Places. If you don't have it, you ought to get a hold of it. You know, in the world when you're broken... It always is a catastrophe. It's, it's a bad situation. It turns out rough. But when God breaks you, he always breaks you at the right place, right time, for the right purpose, and mends it all back together, and you're stronger than ever. Hallelujah. So God breaks the person. But anyway, in the story, Alan Nelson says that he took a trip in a raft, a raft in Maine, and as he was riding down the uh, river he came to a dam and they got out of the raft and came around to go down below and get away from their obstacle and the group coming behind him he said was a group that had a drunken man in it and that drunken man said uh, I'm not going to uh, get out of the boat I'm gonna I'm just gonna go over the dam you know sort of smart aleck he knows what he's doing he can do it well he stayed in the raft, and everybody else came around to the side. And, and while they watched him, the raft flipped over when it came over the dam. And, of course, he plunged into the water, and the water cold and up in Maine. It wasn't long until he was struggling and trying his best to get up and fighting for air, gasping, catching his breath from time to time. And uh, in about five minutes, that cold water is all it could take, and he drowned. And when he drowned, of course, the waters, it was billowing and pulling him down below, pulled him down and uh, put him into the current and pushed him a few feet below where he was and brought him right up into the most tranquil, peaceful area he could imagine. It was just exactly what he was looking for. It's exactly what he wanted. He wanted a peaceful place. He wanted, he wanted a place where he could just lay back and not have to fight. But instead of letting the, the uh, water do that for him, he determined he knew what he wanted. And he struggled and fought and said, but I've got to breathe. I've got to live. I've got to get air. And the water was saying, listen, I'm telling you, if you will dive down, if you will just come down and surrender, I will save you. But he said, no, no, I've got to live. And the struggle killed him. There are times to struggle. If you're Jacob wrestling, you better fight all night long to become a prince of God. But you'd better know when to struggle and you'd better know when to surrender. Hallelujah. Because if you don't know when to do which, you're going to kill yourself. Spiritually, you'll be a dead person if you don't learn how to surrender at the right time. Put yourself in the hands of God. And that's why he says this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. You trust what he said because he, he knows how to do it. Now, his ways are opposite to your ways. Isaiah 55 and 8. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't think like you think. You think, if I can just get up there, if I can just have a bigger car, if I can just be a better preacher, if I can just get to be the camp speaker, if I, if I can, no. He said, if you really want to get up there, come on down here. Surrender. Submit yourself. Put yourself in my hand. And let me take you down here. But there's something natural in us that says, no, God, I want up there. I've got to breathe. I've got to live. 
I've got to make it. He said, well, if you want to make it, surrender. That's what I'm trying to do for you. I'm trying to give you the very thing you want. And if you'll surrender to me, I'll bring you down beneath this flood. I'll take you through these few problems here. I'll get you through these difficulties and bring you up into that beautiful, tranquil state you're looking for. I'm trying to tell you I know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to tell you I know the way. But we say, God, no, that can't be the way. Lord, that's disaster. That, that won't work. He said, yes, it will. Just surrender. Just submit. Just let me have it. And let me show you that I can take you through. Hallelujah. But oh, our old carnal mind has a tough time with that. We just can't seem to sometimes grasp that great truth. But like Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 10, 23, it's not in man to direct his steps. We don't know our own ways. We just don't know what is best in life. But he certainly does. And, and so when I surrender to him, I find out he knew exactly what my soul needed. I, uh, I think of those poor souls in, in John 8 when Jesus was trying to uh, uh, tell them who he was. And he said, if, except you believe I am, you'll, you'll die in your sins. And I'm trying to get through to you people. I'm trying to tell you that you need to know who I am. And, of course, they said, no, sir, we don't believe you. We, don't re we reject that. We, we don't accept that. No, sir, we don't believe it. We won't buy it. And Jesus said, if, if you, in the 31st verse, if you'll continue in my words, you'll be my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you will just learn the truth, the truth sets you free. And it does. You notice they played the musical instruments. You know why they played them? They learned that, and when they learned it, it made them free to play. Now, I'm not free. I don't have freedom in music. You know, if I started banging on it, you'd get all kind of noise. Now, I have freedom with a computer. Why? Because I learned computer language. So, learning the truth about it set me free to play it, to do it, to work it. Hallelujah. Learning the truth of anything sets you free. But especially this. If you learn the truth here, this will set you free to eternal life. Wow. Hallelujah. But these men said, no, no, I don't believe it. I, don't, I won't accept it. I, that's, you're, you're not the one. You're an imposter. I can't believe you. They're like uh, the man that uh, I heard of this summer. I was in Jamestown, North Dakota. And uh, that's where they have the state hospital. There's a man in that hospital that claims he's Jesus Christ. And you walk up to him and say, uh, you really are Jim Smith. And he say, no, no, I'm Jesus. No, sir. Here's your birth certificate, man. You were born this place that time. And here's your mom, your dad. Here's your friends. You are, you are Jim Smith. And I am not. I am Jesus. We tell him, look, sir. If you'll just admit you're wrong, that door's open. You can go out of here free. But he said, no, I'd rather be right than free. I'm right. Well, that's too bad, but that man's crazy. I can understand his position. He's a crazy. Hey, there's people in there that think they're Napoleon or... Or Elvis or who? Hey, they're crazy. And you tell them, look, if you will just admit you're wrong, you can be free. But they said, no, I'd rather be right than free. Well, that's too bad about them. But that's what these Pharisees were doing. They said, no, sir. No, we'll hold on our traditions. We'd rather be right than free. I've seen so many like that. I remember when I pastored Navasota, I went down one day to visit a lady that had not been in church, like Brother Anderson was talking about a while ago. Her place was empty. I came down. I said, lady, what's wrong? Why aren't you coming to church? She said, as long as that woman comes to church, talking about the former pastor's wife, 
And when she comes to church, I will not go to church. I said, what's the matter? She said, well, she hurt my feelings. She, well, she tell me this whole long list of stuff. I said, well, don't you know if you don't forgive her, you can't be saved. Said, I refuse to forgive her. I will not forgive her. I said, but you can't have the freedom of God's presence in your life. You can't, you can't have what you want. If you can't forgive, God can't forgive you. You've got to forgive. And she said, I, God's going to have to forgive me anyway because I am not going to forgive her. I said, I'm sorry, lady. He can't do that. Matthew 5, 25, he said, agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way with him. Lest you find yourself winding up in prison somewhere. And when you wind up in prison, you're not coming out till you pay the last dime. And so the lady's in prison, a spiritual prison she cannot get out of till she's paid the last pittance of her debt. And she's in there. And so I said, look, you could, you, you could be, have the joy of the Holy Ghost. But no, I will not. And so she is not free. She'd rather be right than free. I know another man right here in this city right now who could be pastoring a church, should be pastoring a church. But pride eating away at his heart. And he's got bitterness inside. And so all that bitterness in there, it tells him no I don't like the way they do things. I saw, I saw them do those things. And as long as they are leading, as long as they, I will. And I, oh, that's a sad thing because what you're saying is I've got to be right. And since I'm right, I'm going to hold on to what I know is right. And I'm going to hold on to that whatever you say. It doesn't matter to me because I'd rather be right than free. And that's too bad because you could be free. You really could have the joy of the Holy Ghost. If you just trust him, just lean on him, just yield yourself to him. Hey, he does know what he's talking about. And he does know how to handle your case. Oh, I know sometimes we just think it's impossible. Sometimes we think God is, is uh, telling us something that just simply will not work in my case. Well, it might work with other folks, but with me, no, sir, that just won't work. It's like that man out in Colorado that uh, had that 18-wheeler coming around those curves too fast in those mountain areas. And uh, his truck started going over. And uh, he jumped out. And he jumped out just in time to grab hold of the uh, edge of the ledge that was there and a few little shrubs. And he, but his body kept falling down, uh, slipping. And, and his truck went on hundreds of feet down below him. And he grabbed hold of a little limb down below and uh, held on real tight. And while he was holding on, he started praying. He said, God, I know you're up there somewhere. You've got to help me, Lord. God, some way come to my rescue. God, help me. And the Lord spoke to him and said, okay, I'll help you. He said, God, I'll do anything if you'll just get me out of here. God, if you'll just help me. Anything, Lord. The Lord said, will you do anything I tell you to do? Oh, yes, Lord. Anything. Anything. He said, well, turn loose of that limb. And the man thought about it a minute and he said, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> you see, he couldn't. He, he, surely, surely that's not right. You're not telling me to do that. Surely you're not. Oh, yes, he is. Yes, he is. He knows what he's doing. So you need to just turn loose that limb. Lord bless you. <laughs> Let's stand all over this building. Trust in the Lord.
standing next to you right now. We're going to let you go in just a moment or two, but I, I believe the seed of the word of the Lord has dropped into our heart. Some of us may be in a clutching and grasping mode, and the Lord is just wanting us to let go, just to surrender and say, Lord, have your way in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Won't you pray for your neighbor right now and say, Lord, God, I want, I want us to surrender to you right now, Lord. I want us to surrender to you, oh, Lord. I surrender to you right now, God. I trust you, Lord. I'm not following after my own devices, oh, Lord, and my own past and my own will and way. I'm leaning on you, oh, Lord. I'm leaning on you, oh, Lord. And I'm trusting in you, God. Oh, Lord, it's in my emotions, I give it to you. In my finances, I give it to you. On my job, I give it to you, Lord. My ministry, oh, Lord, I'm giving it to you, God. My past, my present, my future, oh, Lord. My skills, my abilities, my trials. Please like, comment, and subscribe.